Yes, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Again, before starting, I would like to bring to your attention that uh, we have interpretation. Uh, it's available in different languages. So you can choose your preferred language and listen to this very inspiring discussion. First of all, my name is Amira Mohammed, and it's my utmost pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum Knowledge Foundation and the United Nations Development Program to the Virtual Youth Knowledge Forum 2022. Ladies and gentlemen, this unique platform hosts creative minds, experts, and practitioners virtually from around the world to encourage youth to move forward in pursuit of their ambitions in this field, drawing inspiration. Today, I'm honored to moderate this virtual session titled Unleashing Youth Innovation, Innovation for Purpose Economies with our speaker, of course, Faris Al Alami, founder and CEO of the International Strategic Management our speaker of the session is quite unique, to be honest. Faris has been a special advisor and uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem expert with the World Bank, a business advisor with Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Program, and a mentor to MBA students and entrepreneurs globally. His insights into strategies for and facilitation of entrepreneurship activities have been sought out by more than 61 leaders of nations and organizations. So before we start the session, I would like to acknowledge you all that we dedicated the last 10 minutes for your questions and you can share them with us in the chat box. So we can ask Faris these questions in the end of our session. So thank you, Faris, for joining us in today's session, Unleashing Youth Innovation for Purpose Economies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amira. First of all, thank you for the whole Knowledge Forum and the UN uh, effort, as well as, of course, thank you for the very kind introduction. And I'm looking forward to having a discussion with you on this topic and, of course, with all the participants' questions and comments. Before we start our uh, discussion, I believe you prepared for us uh, a very inspiring uh, uh, presentation to start with. So please, the stage is for you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's a few slides. Hopefully, they'll just get us uh, this conversation going. My goal is, as uh, you may already know, I don't like lecturing, <laughs> so I like engaging the audiences with us or the audience with us. So my goal would be just to bring some ideas that we could maybe allow us to have a, a fruitful discussion. So we're talking about the unleashing the youth innovation, and I feel like innovation has a lot to do with the purpose economy that we're in today. And I think there will be lots of opportunities for those who are hopefully with us today to have uh, their own words as well in it. So just a little quick of uh, what we're gonna cover. I'm gonna do a little bit of introduction. I'm gonna talk a little bit about our youth and then we're gonna talk about what can we do to support the youth and their innovation. And then I'm gonna talk about what can we be doing all together here. I'd love to hear, of course, since uh, I see a, a list of people calling from all over, I'm assuming, I'd love to hear where you're calling from, a city or a country, you choose, you could do both. You could put it in the chat, you could put it in the Q&A section, whatever you like. I'm just bringing my chat so I could see where you, what are you writing? <laughs> so I'd love to see where you're calling from, whether it's, uh, you could list your city or you could list your country. You could use either the Q&A section or the chat section uh, to answer this uh, fun question, hopefully, to start us with. All right, I already see some answers, so I'm going to keep going. Thank you very much for, uh, you know, supporting my question <laughs> and taking a minute to answer it. So just a little bit about who I am and how I got here. So I, since Amir did an amazing job uh, summarizing it, I'm going to just... Uh, 
move forward to say my work has always been around entrepreneurship and small business development. And uh, I'm really excited to be here with you today. I want to mention something. Today's youth, a lot of times we discount that they're young or their youth, and we really sometimes override it. And I really want to just bring this to our attention that our youth today is the leaders tomorrow. So if we don't invest in them, then who else will? So this is important for us to just keep remembering as we have this discussion today. And since I already know I probably have all kinds of people on this call, I'd love to hear what do you think when we say youth, I know there are all kinds of definitions for it. I'm going to say somewhere between 20 to 40 or anything you know, before 20. So for now, just if we say 20 to 40, what do you think the population in the world have somewhere between 20 to 40? What's the population? What's the percentage? How many people? You could write the number of people. You could write the percentage. Either way, what's the percentage of the world population today? You could put that in the chat or in the Q&A section. I see already some answers here, 60%, all right. It's a pretty good guess. Anyone else? 70, all right, this is going up. It feels like an auctioneer. <laughs> <laughs> no one's going down, they're just going up. You think 40? Okay. No one going to 40. Oh, I see four. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Uh, I guess uh, we're now going the wrong way, but that's perfect. Uh, there are about 2.5 billion people in, in this uh, age of 20 to 40, which, as we know, we have about 7 billion people in the world. And if you add the under 20, we're looking at 4.9 billion, some estimates 5 billion, some estimates a little bit less, 4.8, 4.6, depending on which site you use, whether it's the UN or it's the world uh, uh, or the World Bank, everyone has a few, little bit of different numbers, but they're somewhat very similar. I'm going to say we have, you know, more than half the world, you know, under 40. And to me, that's a huge opportunity that we could really unleash the innovation that they have. And knowing entrepreneurship and innovation, because it's a space I play in, it's really a huge opportunity because that's kind of like the prime age for people to engage in a meaningful ventures. All right. So a couple of fun facts about us, 60% uh, of the people who are considered youth or teenagers are really interested in starting a business, which is a really great sign of entrepreneurship. And I want to shift the conversation from entrepreneurship as a business starter versus an entrepreneurship as a mindset, a way of thinking. How do you look at a problem? How do you solve a problem? How do you look for opportunities? How do you create opportunities? And if we look at it that way, it's pretty exciting to see that 60% of the people think of entrepreneurship as a way or a pathway for them to keep going. So I think that will also allow us to engage them in the schools and some of the activities in the school system that we may have. Another thing I wanna talk about here is to create these innovations, we must provide the resources that are needed. Now, I think technology the last two to three years have definitely escalated the space of innovation. And I think the access, although there's there are still lots of problems as far as access to innovation and access to technology, it feels though there are many more people today have much more access than they ever had before. As far as knowledge, as far as information, this is another great example here, this platform that we're on today, providing information, discussions around this topic or others like it. So it feels like there's a huge opportunity to keep providing additional resources for this innovation. And then of course, you know, when we look at the, you know, the, the, the youth and what they're thinking about the right resources, sometimes we think of money as one, but I wanna expand that to say money is part of the equation, not the equation. Uh, knowledge, network, connections, understanding, you know, tools, these are all part of what I would say you know, right resources for the youth to be innovative. And I'm connecting this in a minute with the purpose economy because, you know, I think innovation has escalated or expanded over the last few years because of the purpose economy. So how do we encourage innovation? Love to hear from you guys. What do you think? What can we do to encourage innovation? Mm -hmm. You could put in the chat or the Q&A section, what, would, what can we do to encourage innovation? Once I see one answer, I'll move on to the next slide. <laughs> Can I answer? Yeah, please, Amira, go ahead. Uh, believing in youth ideas, maybe. 
beautiful. It's like you saw the slides before. I know you didn't, but I, <laughs> I, I love that. Creative thinking, very good. Yes, you guys got it. I think a lot of times we know it, but we're not implementing it. We know that and you know, you know, creating curiosity in people and letting them be curious is key to creating innovation. If we're curious and we approach things with questions and not right or wrong questions, but more of like open-ended questions, that usually ends up with much more uh, innovation, allowing people to have a free thinking. You know, the whole concept of this is a dumb idea, this is not good, this is bad, is really one way to suppress innovation and to suppress, uh, you know, ideas of generation. And the truth is we have to go through what I call idea generation because not all ideas are good ideas for that one individual person but there might be good ideas for someone else to implement. There might be a good idea to inspire another idea from it. Our discussion today might be a bad idea for somebody, but the discussion itself will generate a new idea for them to maybe think about something different, to maybe think about in a different way. And that's really the idea. So one, create curiosity atmosphere. Second, allow people to have a free thinking space, right? So no, I call it no judging zone. Let people just be free thinking. The next thing is we're going to encourage risk. We always suppress people who may have failed in a business or maybe took a job and didn't do well in the job or didn't do well at school or whatever the scenario is. And we kind of like really pound them hard. And I think what we want to do is think about ways that we could encourage them to take that risk and fail, but then find ways to allow them to learn from the failure. Obviously, if they keep doing the same thing over and over, we need to do something different. But there are ways that we could encourage them to take that risk and learn from it. Okay. So, how can we connect this to the purpose economy? So, I talked about innovation. Now, we want to connect it to the purpose economy. So, the first question I'm sure Amir will ask me in a second <laughs> what is this purpose economy? Uh, and I have a small definition for us to think about. I used to say, we used to be in what maybe people, a lot of people still call today creative economy, which is people want to create things. And I really feel that like during COVID the last two years, we shifted somewhat to be more of a purpose economy. And from my perspective, the simplest way that I look at purpose economy is people used to go for work because they wanted to go to work where they liked to go to work. And today, they're looking for work that is meaningful to them. So what can I leave? And, you know, what, where can I go to work where I could make an impact in the communities that I like or the communities that I care for? or in the areas that I care for, or in the space that I want to be in. Mm -hmm. If you ask some person 10 years ago, a youth, where do you want to go? They used to go, I used to say, they used to find work where they wanted to live, work, and play. Now, they actually find work where there's meaningful to them. So they might be in a city that they don't really like anymore, but they're going there because of the purpose of why they want to be here. And that really is a big shift that we saw the last couple of years. So if you connect this uh, whole idea of innovation and then creativity to the purpose economy, I think we could unleash a lot of, you know, unfolded ideas and businesses and as well as uh, ventures, as well as jobs that we don't even know what they look like today. Uh, I want to end this just by saying, I'd love to hear where you're calling from. I got to know where, what city you're calling from. I'd love to know if you're calling from your office, from your car, from your home, from the escalator somewhere or elevator. Uh, where are you calling from? An airport? I'd love to hear from the chat or see it in the chat. Where are you calling from? Home, okay. So since I got one answer, I like to usually keep moving. Um, those who like to stay connected, there are lots of ways to stay connected with me and with the channels and the discussions that we have beyond this. And then of course, I'd love to hear from you one word about what we discussed so far. And for those who want to give us feedback at the end, if you use your phone now, you will give you a link to where you could come back at the end and give us feedback about this our discussion today. I want to leave a lot of time for Amira. I know she has a, a lot of great questions that I'm looking forward to answer. And those who want to stay in touch with me, please feel free to, uh, you know, use your camera phone again to download my contact information. All right, Amira. Uh, back to you. Thank you so much for allowing me just give a frame or preference or some key points that we could maybe elaborate on. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Faris. Yani, this topic is bringing us a lot of questions. Finding purpose by the definition, it's really, I don't want to say hard, but it's challenging, especially in this very 
fast-paced uh, world. So my question, my first question is, what is the purpose and how can we find it when we are searching for a job in this world full of opportunities? Yeah, that's a loaded question. <laughs> Thank you so much for asking. I, mean, I think when, when I think of a purpose, and of course there's a definition that you can Google, uh, it's about you know being creative, it's about sustainability, about all these things. From my perspective, what I'm seeing from youth and what I'm seeing from people looking for work is it, sometimes it takes a minute to dig deeper on knowing why they're here. And I think COVID allowed many people, not all, but many people to take a minute to reflect on what is it that I want to do? And I think once they start, you have to ask that question first. What is it you want to do? What is it that you want to impact? Is it a community? Is it a per, is it a, a specific topic or a specific idea? Once you identify that, and sometimes, by the way, it might be, I call it a road. It's not necessarily a destination. So you might start thinking, I would love to make an impact in the knowledge economy. I want to make sure that everybody has access to knowledge. And you start that path. And then as you unfold that path, you find something else that you care more about. You find that, hey, sustainability is something I want to look more into. And I want to see that there is more use of solar energy or whatever that is. And then you start evolving to that. So the purpose economy is really finding one, what is it that you care for? And that might take a few questions like why, what, what purposes do you care for? What ideas you, you care for? What beliefs you care for? What cities you care for and then finding work around that specific topic uh, for the first time we've seen more people now reaching out to companies that not necessarily have jobs opening to say hey i like what you're doing how can i get involved that used to happen but maybe once every year once every three years now it's like happening at a much more rapid speed from the different organizations i'm working with People are calling them saying, hey, I like what you're doing. Can we find ways to engage you? I like what you're doing. Can we be more, uh, find ways to collaborate? And I think that's, to answer your question, so number one, dig a little deeper about what you care about. That's one. And then two, find those organizations or purposes or cities or ideas or industries that you care about and start exploring them to unleash your purpose finding mm -hmm. the purpose economy. Yeah, but don't don't you feel like um, isn't hard searching for a career with purpose? And how can we get that dream job where you align your values with work, a job that fuel our spirit and push it to the maximum? Uh, having this mentality, it, it, do you think could limit our career uh, let's say opportunities, isn't hard? Well, I, 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 I'm not sure. So, so to be clear, honestly, from my perspective, uh, I don't want to differentiate between finding a career or starting a business, although they are different and for sure they have different pathway. I really feel from an entrepreneurship perspective, the way you look at things and then innovation perspective, and then you know finding your own purpose, if we look at those three circles and say, what would be the common things between them? I think the, pur the purpose would be that you, this person's self-motivation, right? So what motivates you every day? And I believe to your point, that it is hard to find it, right? It's gonna, this is why I said, it's not a destination, it's a road. So it's a pathway that you take. And you might think today you care about this and you start doing it. And then you realize you don't really care much about it, right? And I think that to answer your question, the first thing I would say is start somewhere. Because if you don't start somewhere today, you're just not gonna take that road that will take you to discovering the purpose that you wanna be in here for. And if you don't take that road because society is forcing you to be something, uh, you have specific ideas about what is success or not, those kinds of ideas usually limit you from, understand, from unleashing what your potentials are because you're going by what you know what you've been fed through information or at least thought through information to make you think one way or another and not being free thinker finding ways and it is tough because you when you take those kinds of roads 
blocks will show up, challenges will show up. Sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes it could be rough, especially if you take a job and you don't like it and you end up not liking being there. The, the, those things could really um, you know, become the roadblocks. But I believe also those things happen even if you go after the career you want to go after. <laughs> those things just show up. So if mm -hmm. my attitude is, if it's going to show up anyway, why not take a path that potentially could unleash your purpose and your knowledge and why you want to do things and how you want to do them? It doesn't mean that you have to start a business. And a lot of times people think that I got to start a business because no one else will allow me to do it. I think that's limiting because sometimes you don't have the, all the resources that you need to start the business. I'm one of the people who encourage, obviously, entrepreneurship and starting businesses. In the same time, I want to encourage the mindset of it because when you think, when you work somewhere, but have this attitude of, I see a problem, I want to solve it, or I see an opportunity, I would like to, to you know, find ways to create it, that mm -hmm. could potentially create some more innovation within, within companies. And those who can take the pill of risking it to start a business, then they could jump ship and do that. But those who can't, maybe they could still be innovative, entrepreneurial way for them to stay within the company and just continue their path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Clearly, sometimes can be limiting because if you work in a job that says you got to do this, this, or this, and if you innovate, <laughs> you're out, that, that that limits some of those ideas. But uh, I think keep finding more of those uh, gigs. Yes. So innovation is linked strongly uh, to purpose economy. What are the other main pillars for purpose economy, Faras? Yeah, I think society has to play a role, right? Because uh, today, as if you look at trends, uh, Amira, and I think, you know, there are many studies that shows, you know, uh, there are lots of people moving from the urban settings to the city settings. And I think when you have density and you have people uh, interacting with each other, more discussions become. And this is why I believe letting people be curious, the idea of mixing people from different from different backgrounds, from different uh, religions, from different beliefs, from different places, from different education level. These kinds of things can really cultivate the whole idea of why do I exist? What do I care for? And it'll also open up the mind to see what else is out there. Because a lot of times if we live in a certain society and it's uh, behaving in a way or another, it not necessarily right or wrong, it just allows you to think in a certain way. And mm -hmm. then that could limit or inspire you to do it. In the same time, if we expose you to more, that might allow you to expand that thinking, right? To expand that idea of, all right, well, I'm curious about why did they say that? Why did they tell me this or that? Or why are they doing it this way? So, you know, I mean, I think, you know, like you saw at the football world, football, you know, some of the Japanese individuals taking bags and cleaning, you know, after after themselves, right? So the question is, why do they do that? Well, there's a whole reasoning behind it versus saying right or wrong, or you shouldn't do this, or you should do that. Allowing people to be curious about the learning of it will allow purpose economy to foster, will allow us to foster, will allow innovation to foster, all mm -hmm. those things somewhat tied together. Mm -hmm. So curiosity is a key and is a main pillar as well. For sure. I think curiosity, uh, free thinking, encouraging risk, uh, and although some of them can overlap with what I call it entrepreneurship and innovation, it's really allowing people to find the purpose that they want. So we're taking it in a different path than what we would take normally to start a business. To so start a business, you're looking at a problem and you're solving it, or you're looking at a, an opportunity, you're creating it. In this space or in this sphere, we're talking about it from the idea that we're allowing you to think about why do you do what you're doing? Why do you care about what you're doing? Yeah, how can you spread good? How you can make an impact? Um, how you can uh, align your values with your work? I think this makes uh, entrepreneurship life feels better, like with all <laughs> the challenges, you know? But it keeps fueling their their spirit to to keep going, whatever they're facing, all the challenges. It's okay as long as I will have a good impact to the world. Then yes, why not? Uh, so how can we empower youth 
through social innovation and entrepreneurship? How can, what, what tools should we give them or just show them the way? I, I think one of the things, I, besides what I mentioned in the slides, I think one of the other things I believe firmly in is exchange. So having opportunities like this platform which allowing us to exchange ideas and thoughts from people from all over the world to have a saying in something. Uh, one, it exposes them to sometimes, unfortunately, to the limited way of thinking of others, right? Because somebody might say, if you don't do this, you're wrong. If you don't do this, you're, if you only, you got to do it this way to be right. So that allows them to see that maybe that's how they sound when they speak, which allows them then to reflect on how can I improve my behavior to, 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 to unleash what I want to do. I think exchange also physically, so allowing youth to go to different places, having them visit different countries, different uh, spots. I think that's a really huge opportunity. I feel like the world can do a better job allowing access and giving and providing access to youth to exchange in that kind of way, uh, because that usually opens up the world. Most people that I've met that did uh, really well later in their life, at one point, they did an exchange. They were exposed to a different place. They were exposed to a different idea that allowed them to be inspired in their own home, in their own place, to do something unique and something purposeful for them and for the people that's around them. So I think exchange would be one. Uh, in addition to, of course, the free thinking, the, the three things that I mentioned earlier, exchange would be a fourth one I would add to say, this is really important if we could find ways to have this exchange, whether it's online, whether it's physical, uh, these kinds of things could definitely unleash a, a whole nother world that's right now being untapped. Mm -hmm. Okay, so exchange knowledge, experiences and ideas. That's, um, that's how we, as a human being, interact and make our ideas and uh, bigger and implement them with um, good purpose for and impact for the world. Um, we are discussing the future economy. And as you mentioned, Paris, innovation and creativity are main actors. How can we instill creativity and innovation in our economies always? Yeah, I think it's a long uh, term uh, mission, maybe for me, because I'm not sure if it will happen overnight. And I think uh, we got to start, I call it from the K-12 system. And I use this example, I, I, I saw so many people discuss it, and I thought it resonated with me. When you are given a coloring sheet, and you colored, uh, you probably were smacked on your hand or told that was wrong, or you got a bad grade. If you colored outside, you know, the little lines that were given and the wrong colors that you're giving. And I think if we think about that as an opportunity right then and there to steal the mm -hmm. concept of innovation, concept of, you know, curiosity, concept of, you know, what are you doing right or wrong? Not saying that you shouldn't have rules and regulations because I believe that we all should uh, have some kind of structure to our lives. Otherwise we'll be madness. <laughs> so, but in the same time, in that kind of setting, if someone colored outside, I think there are ways to correct it for those who want to color it in a certain way, in a certain shape, in a certain color. But also an opportunity for those who are maybe curious to say, why did you choose that color? Letting them just unfold and learn and say, well, usually, you know, bears are brown or, you know, pears are, you know, green. Why did you color it in yellow? Or why did you color it whatever color? And then letting them kind of like speak on it allows them to know that, all right, you're maybe it's a crazy idea. <laughs> maybe it's something that we have never seen. And that's really interesting. And that's great. With this assignment, we might want to do it this way because we're looking for, you know, what we normally would see in this setting. I think those kinds of opportunities are really missed in our I'm going to call it education infrastructure or system. And I think when you do that day in and day out, every day for 12, 14, 16, 18 years, then people's somewhat creativity goes down because they no longer are excited about, you know, doing something different. They're more excited about doing what everybody else is supposed to be doing. And I think we could find ways to encourage that, but yet teach 
what colors are the appropriate colors for these kinds of figures and why would it be different if it was something different? Why are we thinking that way? What makes it unique if we did it that way? I think that could help. So number one, I would say, fuse different ways of teaching. The second, I still see a huge opportunity in the way that we teach. Um, and I'm lucky enough to work with a lot of wonderful, amazing uh, educators that do approach education in a different way. I was lucky enough to, you mentioned earlier, to mentor MBA and BBA classes. And the professor, one of them, I mentored a lot of classes, one of them, the way he taught is he brought people from the streets, I called it, people from who are highly educated, and then the students and pair them up in teams and say, come up with a solution to this problem. Now, I'm not saying that's the only way to teach because you can't, sometimes you need to give them some information, but it's just finding ways to be creative about teaching, engaging them could potentially be a huge opportunity. And I think we're seeing a little bit of that shake up right now at the universities because enrollments are shifting and it's changing and places like this, right? You're providing an amazing platform for people to have education. It's not maybe formal education, but it is education. And people are inspired to find ways that they feel that they will be inspired to go after their uh, learnings. So that could be another way to look at it. So one, uh, infusing different ways of methodology of teaching and two, uh, ensuring that it continues from the K-12 to the university level. Mm -hmm. um, first, through uh, your experience in uh, mentorship and teaching, as you mentioned, what are the main char characteristic of um, this entrepreneur's generation? Uh, what they are going to bring us in terms of purpose economy, how they are contributing to this economy as you are working closely with them as well? Yeah, so one thing we've seen in the last maybe three to five years, a whole trend of what I call it social enterprises so the and you know they're wanting to start a business, but they're not really caring about making the money. They're really more caring about the purpose of why they want to do it. So it doesn't mean that they don't make money, by the way, and it doesn't mean that they're not making a lot of money. They just they started with the notion that you know if I make forty thousand dollars, you know, running the business versus working forty thousand dollars a job, I'd rather do the business because it is for the things that I care about, right? Mm -hmm. So taking the kind of approach versus like I'm going to get rich and famous because I'm going to start a business which is I call it the myth that people try to teach people to start a business because when you look at the reality most entrepreneurs never become rich or famous they just make a living and they you know they provide amazing services for the communities that they live in and based on the demands or the needs of the communities so I think the trend of finding those I call it social enterprises as you can see, uh, you probably have seen a big uh, jump in people wanting to be certified to be like a, you know, organic or certified to be green or certified to be, you know, solar or whatever that is. But now there's like a whole thing called B certification. So there are all kinds of things, even in the U.S. Uh, where I resign and live, it, uh, there is now a whole uh, uh, company called L3C that you could structure your corporation to allow you to take some donations and to be structured to be more social uh, focus or social impact focus. Mm -hmm. So there are a whole other opportunities. And a lot of even, and I think uh, sometimes we, we miss the opportunity to think about a lot of actual entrepreneurs who started their businesses, even to make money, really do a lot of good in their neighborhoods and their in their areas, because a lot of times they end up starting up foundations that donate money to different projects and programs. So, you know, I think it's now being seen a lot more than it used to be seen in the past. And mm -hmm. I think that's exciting to see mm -hmm. the whole idea of, I call it social enterprises and social entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Good. So corporate social responsibility is important when, when we are talking about uh, the uh, uh, purpose economy. It's always uh, important to give back to the community and to have impact. Absolutely. Yeah, they'll, 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 you got it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, Faris, talking about the digital workplace, how can, um, let's say, how can we place meaning and purpose to that digital atmosphere? 
It's hard, isn't it, right? Because <laughs> I only see you in a two by two on my screen. <laughs> so, and, and way. so it's hard to, to do that. I think uh, we need to, this is why I said uh, exchange is a, is a key, not only on digital, but also in person. I think we need to find ways where it's a uh, hybrid. I think the world is going to be hard to ignore technology, right? Because Amira, you and I would probably not have this conversation if I had to fly to Dubai or you had to come to the US for, for an hour meeting and then go back, right? It would be just not realistic and a waste of a lot of time and energy. Uh, utilizing technology this way is key, but then maybe finding other ways to say, all right, let's bring all the people that spoke virtually to the, you know, in person to do something different, right? For two or three days versus the one hour. Uh, let's come up with a different way to connect them. I think we have to find ways to connect people through the technology to back in person, then back to online. I think that's a really big opportunity that I feel the world might miss if we don't leverage it and encourage it right now to really keep the online, but also find ways to connect this in person. Because at the end of the day, we're human and mm -hmm. feelings is really all what we all that really keeps us. I mean, I know people have all kinds of reasons, but at the end of the day, it's all about feelings. <laughs> That's how I look at it and how you feel about things. And feelings, unfortunately, technology just does not bring it up, right? <laughs> it's kind of like brings it back because I'm now behind a screen with a little bit of lights, a little bit of a camera, mm -hmm. a little bit of mic. I feel like I'm communicating, but mm -hmm. I'm not rubbing shoulders. I'm not seeing all the people that are participating. Somebody might be like you know, I'm done. Somebody might be like, this is exciting. Those kinds of things are disappearing now because of the fact that we're using technology. So mm -hmm. I think finding ways to bridge technology with in-person exchange or interaction is really key to foster this purpose and innovation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You mentioned I earlier about the purpose and that it's not money. It's only, it's not only about money. It has many other elements that we should look at it. We should find it. So tell us more about that. Why it's not money? Why it's knowledge? Why it's connections? Why it's information? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of times people think money is the answer. And a lot of times, actually, especially for, I call it for growth stage companies, money is the last thing they need, okay? They need sometimes systems in place or uh, ways of doing things or creating structure. And I think, uh, especially for youth, connections and having access to knowledge can shave a lot of mistakes out of their way. So not saying that you have to do it one way or another, but learning that someone tried it this way and this what worked, this is what didn't work about it, will allow me to think about if I approach it this way to be cautious at least or be cautious about if it goes wrong, I'm already thinking of solutions for that exchange that could happen with me taking that path or taking that road. Because now if I take that road and know that there's a speed bump that will show up, at least I'm aware of it, I'm prepared for it, I could maybe slow down before I hit it, or at least be aware to slow down and look. And if it's not there, then I could speed up and keep going. But allowing me to be, you know, you know, I call it aware of these situations will eliminate, not necessarily 100%, but maybe will bring down the percentage of me making mistakes, the percent, the, long, the time that will take me to get to where I need to go or the destination I'm trying to reach. This mm -hmm. is really why I believe it's important for us to, to foster that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you would give an advice for entrepreneurs of how being an efficient member of the purpose economy, of the future of purpose economy, what kind of advice you will share with them? Uh, <laughs> so one thing I always avoid is telling people what to do or advising them on how to do it, despite the fact that I've been a a special advisor to a lot of people, I always start by saying, you should never listen to my advice. You should think about my advice as questions or opportunities for you to think about it. Because at the end of the day, each one of us is so different. Your access to information, the way you receive information, the way you look at the information is going to be completely different than how I will receive it, how I look at it, 
the access that I have, the access you have, not right or wrong, it's just different, different than anyone who is calling today from Dubai or India or any other place that they're, you know, I saw the long list of different countries, right? I think it's a, it's going to be different. And I think uh, my advice would be is I, you know, I always uh, say this with uh, something I created called the Resilient Entrepreneur Canvas. And I always say, start with what you have, leverage what you already got, right? So those who are waiting for something to come, for them to move forward, I will usually say, stop it. You already have something being where you are, no matter where you are, you have something just being here. So looking at what is it that you have and can I leverage it to do something to make an impact in where I'm at? Now, those kinds of smaller steps for you that you think is small, actually might be a big step for someone else. And it might allow you to start on that, I call it the pathway, or the road that not necessarily, again, not a destination, but it's a road that you start taking. And then as you start taking it, you might find better things. You might find better resources. You might find better connections. You might find better ways. Mm -hmm. But if you don't take that start of start with what you have or start where you are, leverage what you have, then you're really missing the point. So my only advice would be start with what you have or where you are and leverage what you already have without you having to think too hard about, well, I don't have this. I don't, well, listen, we all don't have a lot of things. <laughs> Just work hard. Yeah. You do, well, you, well, you got to start where you are because a lot of times we're looking to be somewhere else to start or we think if we are in this spot, we would be in a better spot. And the reality is it's not. You know, I work with a lot of individuals who might have a lot of wonderful things today. I came from a humble beginning and I'm still in a humble beginning now. And I think that it's important to remember that it might look really good on camera, on paper, on whatever. But the reality is they have their own unique challenges to keep doing what they're doing or to keep going with what they got or to maintain what they have. So... Mm -hmm. It's just a different challenge, it's a different opportunity. So I say, don't look at others, compete with yourself. So the first thing I would say, start with where you are, leverage what you have, number two, and then number three, compete with yourself. Rather than competing with other people like what they're doing, compete, okay, I was here yesterday, I'm here today, and it, I'm here tomorrow, but just sure. keep competing with yourself to move forward. I agree, we need to compete with ourselves and and see and look what where we are today and look forward looking forward to what we want to be in the next day um my last question before moving forward to the q a section and um, as we have many many questions from um, <laughs> from the audience i'd love to share uh, yeah. if, if you have in your mind one example of um of a startup a company um or a person who has um, a purpose, uh, and and that was really a great example for you to just share it with us. Oh man, uh, I think there are lots of uh, stories and examples. I think one of the um, one example I use is uh, you know I worked with an entrepreneur that really cared about food. And they wanted to have access to, they wanted to have, they want people to have access to fresh food. Mm -hmm. So they started gardening in the neighborhood, right? Just taking an empty lot, they bought it. And then they started planting, you know, just basic stuff, tomatoes, cucumbers, right? And uh, they initially were just giving it away. And then before you know it, it became, you know, that lot became second, the second became third. And the next thing you know, they have a little farm that is now providing for the community that they live in. I think, uh, you know, these are, from my perspective, big uh, impacts that they're making in their community. And they initially started without purpose of making money, but the purpose of being purposeful for the work that they're doing in the mm -hmm. community that they live in. And it became fruitful for them at the end because now they have a little, you know, business that's basically providing food for the neighbors that they have. Mm -hmm. Great example. There are, lots, there are lots of examples like this. I mean, I worked with a single mom that was uh, homeless and, you know, she wanted to make $400 a month because $400 a month for her meant 
that you know she could have a safe secure place to keep her kids with her and you know and keep it going and some people might say well what's four hundred dollars going to do well maybe to you won't do much but to this person is life-changing event so mm -hmm. seeing that happen and the way she did it was by providing you know little you know treats for the kids in the neighborhood <laughs> so selling a dollar of a candy here and there uh, maybe it's not the best healthiest snack but people like you know a little candy and then allowing her to have access to those kinds of things to provide for the neighborhood that she's in allowed her to have the safe shelter that maybe allow potentially hopefully one day her kids to move on to maybe a different place of you know a spot or a bigger place that they could have you know their own rooms who knows but they uh, you know seeing those kinds of things that they were driven initially by social uh, reasoning and then became a business leader yeah i can see how how the purpose can motivate us um, through the way to achieve our goals, uh, to impact our community, to have an impact on our communities. Time flies, Faris, with the discussion yeah. <laughs> of knowledge. Thank you. And um, now, uh, of course, uh, we are moving to the Q&A session as we have been receiving here the questions of our um, audience in the chat box during the discussion. Let me check. Um, uh, these questions. Uh, one of the questions is about individual or collective purpose. It's commonly noticed that these two contradict and mainly because people are driven by their personal needs. What's your comment on that? Yeah, it's a, I, th I usually say it's an act or a dance. So you have to think about what your personal needs are. And I really believe this is why I, you know, as long as you're, I call it personal basic needs, and we all know about the psychology, right? So safety, food, and shelter, as long as those three things are usually covered, people can move on to other things and think about other people. But when those three things, something is missing from that, whether it's food, shelter, or security, usually problems happen because now it's about survivor, it's about I gotta live, so therefore, I'm going to just do what I need to do to make me get by. And I think if we could help societies everywhere overcome those basic needs, then I think we will see un, you know, a whole lot of other world opening up. So there is a balance between when to think about you as a person and when to think about your society. And what I will tell you is what I've learned through working with these amazing entrepreneurs and leaders all over the world, that those who you know, stay at it and become really, really good at it and, um, you know, get reward from it, usually start understanding that if the society and the environment that I live in does not prosper, most likely I will also not prosper. So mm -hmm. I need to find ways to give back or balance it to think about the community beyond just me. So I think it's a balance. And sometimes you just have to think about you. Sometimes you have to think about your community. And I think the key is not to stay in one lane or another for too long, because if you, th you know, if you stay in one lane too long, it might become disaster. So balancing between what you get, what you give is really key. And this is how the, let's say the human nature and being balanced is really important to continue. And well, it's easier said, right? So it's easier said than it is done. And this is why I say you have to just be aware of it. So, yeah. you know, it's you just if you're not aware, then it's easy just to take one path and, you know, and keep going. And then not knowing that you're going so long thinking about you, 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 and you haven't really looked around to see what can you do to the community or the other way around. You've been giving so much to the community. You never took care of yourself. You never took your family on vacation. You, you know, I'm definitely guilty of, <laughs> of those behaviors. And mm -hmm. this is why I say it's important to uh, really take the time to think and reflect and to say, all right, next week I have to do X, Y, Z to balance it. And then I can go back to my, you know, selfishness or community or whatever it is that I want to do. But take the time to reflect. I think the key is reflection. Okay, reflection. Other question, Faris, is, um, is that the broad concept sounds utopian. 
Is there evidence that the shift is already underway? The, the what is uh, utopian? Which one? Uh, the broad concept sounds uh, utopian. Uh, okay. Is there evidence that the shift is already underway? Yeah, the ship left uh, back in uh, March of 2020. Uh, so if you haven't seen the whole the whole concept of big resignation, the whole uh, uh, employment uh, surge of people looking for, you know, I call it the, the gig economy became gigger economy, meaning that more people looking for more gigs just because they don't like what they're wanting to do or they're looking for the purpose of why they want to do the work or they're looking for whatever the purpose is. Purpose could be making more money. The purpose could be, I want to have a live in this area. The purpose could be that I want to make an impact in green areas. And then you're finding that more people today are doing whatever else they need to do to find that purpose job or purpose you know, pathway that they want to take. And that's been, you know, the ship had left probably back in June of 2020 with the whole concept of people leaving jobs to go somewhere else or leaving jobs not even to work uh, till they find the purpose that they care for. Yes. That is already happening. That's a trend that's been happening. When you look at the youth today, the, most of them are, some of them are sticking around for more college than, uh, than going to work right away, which is also a shift. It was trending before, but it's now at a much higher speed and a much bigger percentage. Mm -hmm. So these kinds of data kind of like indicate that there is a shift and the shift started probably in 2020 and we're right now still in it. And I think it usually takes, you know, somewhere between five to 10 years for, I call it data to start talking about it. We're just, you know, I'm lucky enough to be in the mix of the ground to see it. And I think, you know, in five or 10 years from now, you'll start seeing reports about all of these concepts that we're talking about today, how it happened back in 2020, because the studies are not there yet to mm -hmm. support it beyond the trends that you're seeing. So we're seeing the trends. Now we need to start thinking about it and talking about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Faris. Another question uh, from our audience uh, is, what are the main reforms needed at national levels to nurture purpose economies? Yeah, I think, you know, I could recap it in one uh, education reform. So making sure that there is some kind of ways to encourage innovation, not necessarily, and, you know, uh, you know, purpose, right? So you're not saying find your purpose, you're saying, let's find ways to create innovation, curiosity, create uh, entrepreneurship mindset, uh, create ways of approaching, you know, science and and not necessarily that you want, we want everyone to be scientists because we need creative people also. We need all kinds of people to do all kinds of things. Every role is important. I think we need to find ways that would be my second thing to elevate all the roles of individuals and jobs that people do because a lot of times we look down at someone doing something that maybe we think is less meaningful when it's very meaningful to them and very meaningful to, to you to receive the service that you're getting. And I think we need to find ways to elevate that. So number one, maybe education, uh, you know, revisit of how we educate and how education can be fusing some curiosity a lot more, innovation a lot more, entrepreneurship a lot more. Second is elevating and making sure that all positions, no matter which position you take, are exactly equal to any other position that someone else have. A doctor, uh, same as an engineer, same as lawyer same as a someone cleaning you know the, the the roads they're all the same and i think if we could find ways to elevate that i know it's not easy because unfortunately we're human and human always find ways to judge each other <laughs> so if we could find ways to encourage and have this exchange discussion exchange between the people exchange between different backgrounds exchange between different ideas more more welcoming and more accepting of each other becomes more reality. Yes, um, it's important to exchange as you emphasized many times in this session, how important to exchange ideas and knowledge and the impact that we will have on our economies through this process. Um, I will end up this um, discussion with this question that um, I really want to know the answer. If you can recommend uh, books uh, on purpose, uh, economies, and innovations. Sure, there are lots of books. I love books. Uh, I think uh, one of the books that I, I've always thought it was 
a great insightful because allowed me to reflect on me was the eighth habits um, by Stephen Covey. He's a really great, uh, you know, author and he has a lot of wonderful books that you could uh, enjoy. Start with Why by Simon Sinek. I mean, the, there is a whole list of books, uh, the Rockefeller Habits. There are lots of books that I feel like uh, have allowed me to add it more to my shape and how I think and how I look at the world. And, uh, you know, fill your bucket, uh, the, this now discover your strength. Uh, the, the list is long. <laughs> so I hope that these uh, four or five or six names that I mentioned uh, could potentially allow you to unfold your personal journey of what you can do to keep moving forward. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Faris. A big thank uh, to you, Faris Al Alami, for sharing with us um, your thoughts, experience in this engaging and insightful session, um, Purpose Economy. We knew more about it, um, many examples you shared with us, uh, main pillars, and how important to have an impact on this world as human being through our work, day-to-day -day work. And it is really important, of course. Thank you. Thank you so much, Faraz. Thank you, Amira. Thank you very much, of course, for the Muntada, for the Multapav, for the, for the Knowledge Forum, for the UN effort, for everyone behind the scene. There's so many people, when I look at my screen, that without them, the translation, the, the technology, the people streaming and I know that there's probably a whole other team that's not even here that's doing all this stuff and coordinating. So I just want to say thank you for all that effort because it does take a village to raise the level of uh, community and connections and uh, ideas. And I appreciate it and thankful for the opportunity and honored to be with you. Thank you. And of course, again, I'd like to thank the organizers of giving us the opportunity to be part of this platform where we can exchange valuable knowledge for a better future for youth. Thank you again, Faris. Thank you for our audience for being here with us today and wishing you an exciting and fruitful afternoon. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.